The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to the webinar. The title of today's webinar is Engaging Challenging Clients and Crisis Communication, and I'll introduce our speaker shortly. Uh, next slide. A couple quick disclaimers before we get started. Uh, the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. The contractor's findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Uh, next slide. A quick note about our APS TARC. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. Uh, contact info will be displayed at the end of the webinar. We work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Uh, next slide. Please consider joining our peer-to-peer -peer calls. We have three calls per month, one for APS investigators, one for APS supervisors, and one for APS administrators. Uh, the schedule for these calls is on your screen. You can check our website or email us if you'd like more information or want to get the registration link and join a call. Uh, next slide. We also have a page on our site dedicated to COVID-19 and Adult Protective Services. There's a link to this page and a red box at the top of our site. On this page, you'll find resource information and a summary of state program responses to the pandemic. We hope you find that helpful. Uh, next slide. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this session is being recorded and it will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify via email all of those who registered today when it's posted online in approximately three to four weeks. If you have questions of our presenters, uh, simply type them in the questions box at any time. We'll pause for questions and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. All the participants are muted for this webinar and you must use your computer to access audio. Um, if you have any problems with the audio, we suggest exiting the webinar and then re-entering. Uh, note that due to the large number of people currently working remotely, webinar systems are occasionally experiencing problems. Please be patient with us. If we experience any audio or video issues, we'll try to resolve them as quickly as possible. And finally, today's slides are available to download in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. There's a PDF there if you just click on the title and you can download them. Uh, next slide. Now, a quick poll to get a feel for the professions in our audience. I'm gonna launch this poll right now and you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. Um, so you should have the poll up right now. Which of the following categories do you identify the most with? Adult protective services professional, other social services professional, um, a medical professional, legal professional, or other. Um, so just click directly on your screen um, and vote. Let us know which of these you identify the most with. We'll leave this up just a little bit longer so that folks can um, vote for us. We'll leave it up about mm, 10 seconds longer so we can get some votes from people. And then I will share the results with everybody to take a look at. All right, looks like we have over half the folks who have voted. So I'm going to close that poll out now and share the results with everybody. It looks like about 43% consider themselves an adult protective services professional, 39% other social service professional, then other at 12%, um, and then medical professional at five and legal professional at 2%. So thanks for taking that poll for us. We appreciate it. Um, so uh, next slide. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Heather Sylvester is a licensed clinical social worker who has worked in the field of behavioral health for 20 years, both as a professional and as a paraprofessional. She graduated with honors as an MSW from California State University, San Bernardino in 2007. Her professional experiences include working with transitional aged youth and adults who have severe persistent mental illness at the Riverside University Health Systems Behavioral Health, County Behavioral Health, she worked for the county's full service partnership, serving individuals whose mental illness symptoms have resulted in chronic, chronic homelessness, frequent hospitalizations, frequent incarcerations. Additionally, she provided outreach focused therapy for individuals who were not able to utilize traditional mental health services. 
Since that time, she's worked both as a trainer for the department and now as a supervisor for the full service partnership. Since 2014, she has been working at California State University, San Bernardino, as a field liaison for the MSW program. And we're very lucky to have Heather with us today, and I want to turn things over to her. All right, thank you so much. Well, I'm very happy to be here today. Um, we've got a wonderful topic to talk about. And, and really, these seem like some, they seem like very, maybe not related topics. Why is engagement important? How does engagement and crisis go together? But really, I found over the years that engaging people really does help in the crisis. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on engagement and then we'll move into crisis and particularly crisis communication and how is it different than our normal communication strategies. So why do we talk about engagement? You all have jobs that are incredibly challenging. You are going out into the field and asking people, often engaging people at their worst possible points in their lives when they are facing ex external threats. And, and so that engagement, how we engage those people, what do we do to build that rapport and the relationship makes a world of difference between whether or not you'll be successful, whether you can get them involved in, in a treatment strategy or whether or not they will kind of shut down. And not, I mean, it's not like you have an all magic powerful system <laughs> that you are all powerful and, and it's all up to you. Um, but, but our ability to engage really can make a difference. And when we spend time on engagement, it can really get the buy-in of the people that we are encountering. I spend a lot of time with individuals who have schizophrenia, with people who have personality disorders, with people who do not like what I am selling. And so I really have to do my work to get them to buy in to what I'm offering them. So there's a few primary reasons why it can be difficult to engage someone. First off is it may simply be your approach. I use a lot of humor and sarcasm just as part of my natural personality. Um, when I first started, I thought I was that that was going to work for everyone because it works. It's part of just me being genuine. However, you take someone who's deeply depressed and you throw Heather doing her best sarcasm, that's not going to be effective. And it flopped horribly. Um, sometimes you have people who genuinely just don't think that there is anything you can do to help them or the types of help that you're offering are things they don't want. I work with homeless. The majority of my clients are homeless. So when I'm offering them to go to a shelter or a shared living situation, it's not that they want to stay on the streets, but the streets are preferable to going to a place where they have to be locked indoors for 12 hours at a time. Sometimes there's secondary gains. Um, crisis services meet needs quickly. And so traditional services, going along the way things, you know, the way we want them to go, that takes time, that takes effort. Um, people, get, people get used to the crisis. If you live your life as a crisis, normal feels uncomfortable. So there can be secondary gains to creating crises. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. 
And then the last two will really focus on, which is denial of a problem. And this last fancy word is called anisogosia. And you will see anisogosia is a neurological condition, um, which is primarily seen in individuals that have schizophrenia as well as dementia. You'll also see it sometimes with people who have bipolar disorder as well. And they their brain is wired in such a way that they are unable to realize that they have an illness. So if you, if I, I'm sure most of you have encountered someone who has dementia and you take that person and they, and you're talking to them and you ask them what year it is and they say it's 1982 and you say, but no, it's 2020. They are adamant that it is 1982 and that maybe you are their son or their daughter or their spouse instead of their worker. And that is, and you cannot convince them of anything else because their brain is wired to believe a certain set of facts from their perspective. So we see this in dementia all the time. And what's interesting is also that this is common with people who have both mania and bipolar, as well as schizophrenia. There are some similarities in the brains of people who have all three of those conditions. And so often we are trying to convince them to get help, but they legitimately cannot recognize that they have any real mental health challenges or, you know, for the individuals with dementia, that they have any memory gaps or any problems whatsoever. And so this impacts their ability to receive voluntary care and results in them getting involuntary care, whether that be through the justice system or through agencies like yours, like APS, CPS, um, other agencies where care becomes mandated because they're not able to recognize their need for voluntary care. One of the things that I would frequently fall in, I would frequently fall into this trap of if I could just prove to them, they would come, to, someone with schizophrenia would come to me and they would tell me about uh, the, that the CIA was following them. And I thought that if I could just prove to them that the CIA was not following them. That why in the world would the CIA be following you? Are you doing anything of particular interest? Are you, you know, what is it? Why in the world would anyone, why would that be? And I would get into these long convoluted arguments and I was good. I, I could go down any rabbit hole that they could, that they could take me down. But no matter what, I never won the argument. What did work was my relationship. Um, because while I was failing in trying to win the argument and convince them that the CIA was not following them, I was building relationship. Because I was actually kind of, I was talking to them. I was spending time with them. I was often feeding them, getting them clothes, showing that I cared about them. I was worried about their stress level. And I would just occasionally throw out these things. I wonder if, and then I would drop it. The relationship is what worked. So, Dr. Xavier Amador is the founder of the LEAP model. 
And this is a model that is specifically designed for individuals who have anosognosia. And this is, it, it lays out some basic principles in working with these individuals that not only work for them, but that are just really good principles when engaging any challenging clients. I have worked with, um, I was sharing with Andrew today, uh, I, I, think, I think that um, whether whether you see it as God or the universe, um, but it, someone was preparing me for today's talk because we had a client who um, was agitated about we, we the county is the payee for many clients, and a client was agitated about not getting the check and decided to throw a chunk of concrete at her window, um, and and it reminded me that you know. Often our services are not met with gratitude um, because who would want to have someone else met? Who would want someone else to manage their money? Who would want someone to be in control of their lives? Even if you do recognize that you have challenges, even if you do know deep down that you need help, no one wants to be in that position. And this is what we see over and over again. If you were in a position, if you work for an agency like Behavioral Health, but particularly for those of you that work in Adult Protective Services, you're, you're often providing services that are required not necessarily um, not necessarily going to be met with a lot of joy and happiness and and that's hard. But if we go with the idea that okay, people are not going to see me and say, yay, there's Heather County social worker. but, if when I when they see me, they know, all right, she's 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 here, she's not gonna try and do any harm, she's gonna be fair, and I can go in understanding that they are experiencing fear, loneliness, a loss of control. And if I can validate those feelings, I don't have to validate the behavior of chucking a, a chucking concrete at our window. That I'm not, I'm never gonna validate that behavior. But the feelings behind that will help me build that relationship. When I can say, you know what, it makes sense that you feel powerless to have someone else control your money. It makes sense that you're frustrated and this behavior is not okay. Both can be true at the same time. So LEAP is a model that follows these four principles. Listen, empathize. Um, so LEAP is, LEAP is a training that you can, they have all sorts of versions of it and this is this is the um, crammed into 20 30 minute version of it but uh, it's it's such a great model and i really encourage you if you ever get a chance to take the longer version of it please do because it is it is a very there are so many different tips and techniques that you can do by taking the training so step one is listen and listen reflectively. Uh, I, <laughs> I like to say I, I, I started out in this profession and I still do it, especially when it comes to my family. I listen to figure out how I can implement the Heather 10 point plan for success, which other people should use. I just never do. 
Um, and so really instead what I need to do is I need to listen to hear what is the other person actually saying. And I'm not just listening for content, I'm listening for the emotion behind it. Because sometimes people are are saying saying really profound things about how they feel, about how they're experiencing the world, but they may not have the words to articulate it. Especially if you're dealing with someone who is struggling with mental health issues or with cognitive impairments. Their language ability gets affected so by paying attention to the tone of what they're saying you may be able to pick up on those emotions and that can be just as powerful so listening to what are their beliefs about having whatever illness or impairments that they have what does their family and culture say about that does having this problem make them feel weak and inferior? Are they not able to perform in the roles that they're used to? Does it feel like they are a burden on their family, that they have to take medication or that other people have to provide care to them? And does it change how they see the world? Thinking about working with the elderly, you have a lot of people in that age group who had a different vision of what their retirement would look like. And now because of health issues, because of finances, it just doesn't look like what they wanted to. By taking this step and and slowing down and instead of offering solutions but just by listening to what it is by listening to their pain you really do get a better sense of how can i meaningfully respond to what it is that they have to say and then you emphasize you empathize with their experience and this is not empathizing with behaviors that are inappropriate, but it's empathizing with the emotions. Of course, people are frustrated and afraid and there's discomfort and people want to have a different life. Those things all make sense. And one of my favorite sentences is, it makes perfect sense that you would feel, and then I fill in the blank with an emotion word. It makes perfect sense that you would feel afraid. It makes perfect sense that you would feel frustrated. It makes perfect sense that you would feel angry. By saying those things, you get to the heart of the matter and you build that relationship because it's a way of saying, I hear what's going on beneath the surface. And when you can do that, you let them know, I'm not here just to tell you what you need to do. I'm here to actually listen and help partner with you. This super hard for me because because I, I I definitely have opinions about any everything, anything and everything. Um, but delaying giving your opinion off even if they ask for it. So many times clients come to me and you know, I've been in the field for a long time and they say, Heather, you've been around for a long time. I want to know what you think. And that feeds my little ego and I'm like, Woo, okay, yes, I'm smart. I know all the answers, but I can't, but this is a trap because if I tell them my, my opinion, it damages relationships, particularly if it's something that they don't want to hear. Or if I haven't really listened to them and I've missed a key component of their story. 
So if I say, you know, first I need to get more information. I may say, you know, I, I don't know that I can make that decision for you. Especially if they're wanting me to make a decision about, you know, should I, what do you think? Do you think I should put my, my loved one in a care facility? Um, do you think that I should take medication? I may full, uh, often my answer wants deeply to be, yes, you should take medication. But what happens if they take the medication and they have a bad reaction? Then I've damaged the relationship. Instead, it's better for me to say, you know what, tell me what your pros and cons are about taking medication. Let's talk this through together. Because then regardless of how they react to the medication or regardless of whether or not what happens with their family, our relationship stays intact and I get to continue working with them throughout, the, throughout their entire course of treatment. And that is more meaningful than whether or not they take medications for a week or two. Because often there are bumps in the road when it comes to treatment. So if I can be more long-term in that care, I'm going to be more effective. So the three A's when it comes to these interactions, apologize. I apologize all the time. I apologize, I, I often try, when someone's angry, I try to find something I could have done differently. Even if it was, I was five minutes late, or I apologize, I didn't understand what you were saying. Sometimes I'm apologizing for our system. Our system is chaotic. Most of us work for government agencies. There's a lot of bureaucracy. So even if I personally haven't done something, I apologize for the system and for the fact that, you know, we make you show up on time, but half the time we're running a half hour behind. I'm sorry that you had to wait. I acknowledge that I don't know everything and it's okay that we don't always agree. It's part of how we're, we're retraining people how to have relationships. We don't have to agree to get along. And that piece is really important, particularly when it comes to crisis communication. If I set this tone up early, it will pay off dividends when it comes to crises. So when it comes to the agree, I want to just focus really on what are the pros and the cons? What are the things that they feel are beneficial when it comes to any service? It talks here about treatment, but it could be about whether or not to, to accept in-home health services. For a lot of people, if you, if you have dementia, but you don't think you do, Accepting a caregiver, why would I need a caregiver? I'm totally fine. So what? this is where we just start looking at what are the pros and the cons? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Then we partner together to work on mutual goals. Are there any options that the client didn't consider? So someone who may need a caregiver, if their biggest fear is, I don't wanna let a stranger in, in my home, maybe they need to consider, is there anyone in their, in their natural community that could be their caregiver? Is there someone from their faith community? Is there someone, a neighbor who could become their caregiver? Someone that they're familiar with enough that they would that would help to offset that this is after you've done your listening and your empathizing this is where you actually get to start problem solving but too often 
I know, at least for myself, I would start off, I would listen for about two minutes and I would be like, oh, well, we just get your neighbor or your daughter to help be your caregiver. And instead of allowing them to fully express their feelings, I would jump straight to problem solving. And I need to give them time to arrive there on their own. So obviously that is a, you know, that's a dramatization, but it is, it does kind of highlight the idea that by taking that extra time to really make sure that you understand where the person's coming from, by giving them that space to say why they feel a certain way, it creates a much better partnership. and and it helps you achieve a result in the longer term. And your results are much more likely to stick versus just getting the quick yes that doesn't follow through. So the LEAP model is, is something that's very powerful and translates into crisis services. Because if you have a good partnership, when crises happen, it does go a long way to, to mitigate crises, the severity of crises. So we're gonna translate, we're gonna trans, um, we're gonna move into the crisis model a little bit more. I wanna talk about what a crisis is. Um, and I start out with this idea of, of stress. All of us have stress and we need a little bit of stress. If we don't have stress, we wouldn't move. <laughs> if I didn't have bills to pay or, you know, um, if I didn't have anything that I needed to do, I probably it wouldn't necessarily go to work every day. Um, we, we the stress kind of gets us up and going having to be to work on time uh, those those types of things get us up and moving in the day and as things progress there is kind of what's called the goldilocks zone the the optimal peak amount of stress where we're thinking clearly, we can move, we can we can shuffle pieces around on the board, and we can we can get our work done. But you've all experienced this. I guarantee you, you've all experienced that that point where there have been there you've reached that peak that peak of stress where there is so much going on that your ability to be productive goes completely out the window because it overwhelms our brain's ability to process any sort of language, any sort of, of any cognitive ability. And so over time, this really just takes a toll on us as individuals. 
So a crisis for any one person can vary because it really is when our perceived stressors outmatch our perceived resources. You think about many of the individuals you interact with, it could be, you know, that their food stamps get cut off. Now, for you and I, if we were reliant on food stamps, we may have the cognitive ability to then say, all right, I don't have food stamps. I can hop on the bus and go to different food banks. I have friends who could, who would help me out with food. I could go to, you know, we could problem solve. But if I don't have transportation to get to different food banks, if I don't have natural supports, or if all of my natural supports are just as strapped as I am, I don't have the resources to meet that stressor. And now that stressor has become a threat. So everyone's crisis can look a little bit different because it depends on what resources we have. And when we become, when we hit a crisis, this is what, what is unique about a crisis is, is that neurologically, when we get to that point, our frontal lobe, and I'm not a neuroscientist, I just like to pretend I am, but our frontal lobe, you ever get a chance um you can go on youtube i didn't have time to go into it for this but you can go on youtube and watch um the hand model of the brain by dr dan siegel and he talks about the idea that when we when we get to that point where we are so stressed out the frontal lobe the part of our brain that processes language that processes co um, complex thought completely goes offline. And so if I'm trying to talk to someone, if I'm trying to get them to see reason and that part of their brain is not working, I'm going to fail. And so when they're in a crisis, this is where I have to focus on how they feel and helping them to feel safe and, and doing what I can to get them to a place where they can re-engage that part of their brain. And a simple set of, a simple acronym that we use is called TACT. Time, Atmosphere, Communication, and Tone. So first and foremost is time. One of the things that we want to do is have a plan. And this is, hopefully you all have a plan. You can't plan for every eventuality, but what do you do as an agency? What do you do as a team when you are faced with a client who is emotionally distraught? who is agitated, who is a danger to themselves or others, who's gravely disabled. What, what is your general strategy? If I have a rough outline of what to do, then I am not going to be in a crisis. Because if, if I'm trying to deal with a client who's in a crisis and I am in crisis, then neither one of us are going to be successful. So if I have a general agency plan, then I can just I can just alter it a little bit to make it work. Then I can use patience. Um, a lot it's it's very difficult for anyone to sustain high energy output for a long period of time. Now, there are certain, you know, if someone is using meth, <laughs> they're going to be able to sustain it a little bit longer than, than normal. But even so, for the most part, 
they're not going to be able to stay at an elevated level of agitation or emotional output for that long. I really liken this to the idea of you think of the two two year old or the three year old that you take to the grocery store and you, they want the candy and they start out and they're screaming and yelling on the floor and they're kicking and everything and and you either give in and buy them the candy because you have to get the rest of your grocery shopping done or you throw them over your shoulder and march out of there and you know and and what eventually happens is you throw them it's you don't throw them i'm sorry i know i'm talking to, to aps workers um you, you know you put them gently and strap them into the car you put them in the car and then it, what happens is they fall asleep because they have worn themselves out so when you when you have that when you can use patience you basically give yourselves time to wear them out a little bit because they can't sustain that output for very long. Now, if I've done my work and I have built that relationship, I also have information going in. So I know, all right, this person is struggling because they feel that, you know, this caregiver is stealing from them. And this is the fifth caregiver that they've gone through. Or, you know, this person is, is and their family actually has put them into a home and they are, they are, feeling incredibly hurt and betrayed because of that, knowing that ahead of time, it gives me a sense of what emotions am I dealing with. That helps me to, to get myself together. Then there's about physical safety with the atmosphere. So distance. I want to make sure that I keep my distance, not only to keep myself safe, but there is, I don't necessarily have the exact statistics for APS, but when we come, when it comes to public behavioral health for adults, it, well, actually I can just actually I do have the statistics because by the time someone reaches the age of, of, of I believe it is 70, 80% of the population will have experienced some form of trauma. Now this doesn't mean that everyone's running around with PTSD. It just means that trauma is a public health issue. So if, if my logical part of my brain is already not working and someone is also getting in my space, I'm more likely to react. So this is why if I have someone who's escalated, I want to increase my space. I want to consider what is in the environment? Are there other people who are egging them on? Are there other family members? If I'm in, you know, are there other staff? Sometimes we all, when a code will get called, um, all the staff show up and to respond, but do I need all the staff there? I may only need one or two people. So I need to create some space to, to help stimulate a sense of calm. Then I can engage and build rapport. I want to make sure that I'm using their name and I'm telling them my name if I don't know them. Hopefully I have a bit of information, but sometimes you know, I may just be the triage staff who's responding to the crisis that's happening in the lobby. And so I want to look and listen for any cues. I can use LEAP in a crisis as well. I just may not have all the details. I'm listening for that emotion. 
then I use my tone of voice. I demonstrate compassion. I ask questions. I really want to say this. When someone is in a crisis, I want to use as few words as possible. The language center of the brain is incredibly, it, it, it takes an incredible amount of processing power to process words when we're upset. And, and again, I'm sure you've all experienced this when if you, depending on whether you're a morning person or a night person, if someone catches you when you're tired and they ask you a question or they just start talking to you, but you're really tired, even if the questions are very benign, you may you can re, you can recall how irritating it is and that's because that part of the brain that it takes to process language is having to work really hard so when someone is in crisis we want to use limited words be direct don't use um don't you, we want to just say, you know, I often will just say, do I need to be afraid? If someone's making vague statements, I will just say, do I need to worry about my safety? Are you going to hurt me? Are you upset? You know, tell me what's going on. Very simple, short sentences. Once I think I understand, I then can go back and say, okay, here's what I think you're saying. Tell me if I'm wrong. And I give them permission to correct me. I, the other, the, the other couple of things that are really powerful and, and go a long way are being aware of how we respond and what our own nonverbals are. When my first couple of years, I, <laughs> I, I gave myself, um, I actually gave some coworkers permission to give me feedback about what does my face look like or what, what messages do I send? And it was very powerful to be able to hear the feedback because I do not have a poker face. <laughs> I am very expressive. And I had to learn how to manage my facial expressions. And I really worked on it. So I had a couple of people who I could handle hearing it from, and I gave them permission to just tell me, okay, this is what, this is the vibe you're giving off. This is what's coming across. And half the time it was completely unintentional and it helped me to be a, become aware of what messages I was sending out and who was I reacting to because there are going to be people that push our buttons in different ways. There are going to be people that make us want to run the opposite way. There are going to be people that make us want to throw on our capes and dive in and rescue and take them home with us. And, you know, whatever it is, we are human beings and we are constantly told that we have to keep it professional and keep every keep everything you know check our personal lives at the door all that stuff and that's just not realistic i mean we of course we keep it professional but but that takes work right so so the little bits if if the person who who makes me want to throw on my cape i'm more likely to ignore when they become aggressive and I may put myself in a riskier situation because, oh, that's just them. They would never do anything like that. 
or the person who irritates me, I may be more on edge and may be less likely to notice when they're really sad and in pain. And I may be less likely to hear them out, which may actually trigger aggression. So by knowing my own emotions and, and who I respond to in what way, I actually create this environment where I have a little bit of control over other people's reaction. Not entirely, of course, because people are, people are grown. They, they're responsible for their own behaviors. But to some extent, as I become more aware, I can make sure that I'm at least not adding to it. And so a couple of things just to add on to this, make sure your directions are simple and one at a time. So if I need someone, if I have someone who's screaming and getting in my face, my first direction is to ask them to back up. I need you to back up. I need you to back up. I need you to back up. And when they do, I want to thank them. Then I can move on to the next directive. Someone in that crisis mind frame cannot follow multiple step directions. Even if they're not angry, even if they're sad, I can't give them multiple steps to follow because someone who's sad, it can flip really easily. So focusing on one thing at a time and really tuning into how a person is feeling, not just the words. Because for those people who have the disorders like dementia, uh, traumatic brain injury, who've had strokes, who have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, the words are going often not to make, they're not going to make sense a lot of times. But we can, if we pay attention, we can get a sense of how they feel. And I've had multiple times where I've had someone who could not put words in an order that made any sense to anyone, but I could get a general idea of how they felt. And by communicating that, that I, I could see, I understand that you're scared, but I promise that you're safe here right now. And I could visibly see them relax. Because even though their words didn't make sense, they could understand mine. And so by paying attention to those emotions, I was able to address the crisis. So I want to take some time and answer any questions that you might have. Um, and thank you very much for allowing me to join you. Thank you, Heather, for this opportunity. We really appreciate you doing this presentation. I know when I worked in adult protective services, you know, having worked in mental health system as well, I felt like I had some preparation, but a lot of APS workers have not worked in mental health, so they can be very, yes. challenging, very challenging cases. So um, I can understand that completely. One thing that came up a bit ago um, was you mentioned a video on YouTube. Um, I think I found it while you were talking, the hand model of the brain, is that correct? I yes. That. And it's Daniel Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L. Yes. Hand model of the brain by Dr. Daniel Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L, and I found it pretty well yes. with that info. So good deal. Just wanted to clarify that for everybody so they can go take a look at it because it sounded very interesting. Um, so we have some really good questions. I'm going to start with a pretty challenging one. <laughs> so okay. um, what are ways to build rapport with someone who may be nonverbal? 
So if you have a client that's nonverbal, is there any recommendations for building rapport with that person? Yes. So I, okay, so a couple things. One is if they, if you know of any of their interests, I, I actually had a couple, I would have clients who I would just sit and color with them or engage in a, a simple, um, I, I kept a lot of, I had my little, my little bag of tricks, I called them, I, I had tactile, a lot of tactile toys, mm. so yeah. stretchy, stretchy ball things, um, fidgets, and, and we would just play. So taking those things, coloring, um, because if they're nonverbal, you can still have those interactions. And the coloring and the art is can be really profound. If they have motor difficulties where they cannot do that, this is where finding if they have favorite YouTube uh, channels that they like to visit or favorite characters that they enjoy. And you can engage them with that as well. Great, very helpful answer. Um, and so this one is, is a little tricky too, and you may not be familiar with um, part of the question, but how is LEAP different than motivational interviewing? That's, uh, of course, if you're familiar with motivational interviewing at all. I am. And so I think the big thing, it, there, there's some, definitely some similarities. The difference is that with motivational interviewing, at some point, the person has an awareness that there is a challenge. So there's the stages of change in motivational interviewing. Um, and so with LEAP, you're not going to get to the place of contemplation. Uh, you're you're going to get to the place of partnering, but like we saw in the video, the only motivation for that guy to take the shot was to get his dad off his back. Mm. And and so you're not you're you're never gonna. Well, I shouldn't say never, but for the most part, you're not going to get to a point where you're going to convince that guy that, yes, you really do have schizophrenia and the medication is going to fix that. Right. And so with motivational interviewing, it may start there, but you're going to move through that. A lot of the same strategies, but motivational interviewing goes much farther. Gotcha. It's very helpful. Um, and a related question, is there a fee for the LEAP Institute training, if you're aware of one? So there are, there are LEAP trained individuals all throughout the United States. So it, I, I can't specifically answer that because it depends upon some places do it for free, some places do charge. So you can just go to their website and put in where you are located and find a trainer near you. Great, thank you. Um, do you ever use music uh, in your work with clients oh, in crisis? Oh gosh, yes. Music is incredibly powerful. Um, there's a lot of research that shows music is is incredibly tied to our development the music that we uh that we loved in our late teens early 20s is going to have some of the strongest pull for us throughout our years so we can use music to turn up positive emotions or to help express painful emotions in a healthy way so i I actually will use, I will help clients create their own playlists to help navigate their emotions. Oh yeah, I could go on that. Uh, that's a, that's a whole, <laughs> that's a whole tangent on itself. 
but yes, music, um, music, and especially helping people cultivate songs that help them, that help soothe them yes. when they're struggling. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, just a quick note for the attendees, we had several questions about the recording. Yes, this session is being recorded and we will post it online in about three to four weeks. We will also post the uh, slides from today, but you can download those now in the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel. So um, just an FYI for the few folks that asked that. Um, here's a good question. Any recommendations on how to regain trust with a client? So this is where the apologizing part comes in handy i it, a part of my job is i have to sometimes write in a, a hold for someone or i have to file an aps or cps report or um you know i have to i have to put someone do an involuntary hospitalization for someone and that automatically breaks trust and so then going back and and apologizing, not that I had to do it, but that the situation occurred and and allowing them, so one, apologizing that, that the situation occurred and two, continuing to show up mm. by, by allowing people just to be angry and not, and not going away because for so many clients it is i show you my anger and then you never want to see me again that's the that's the pattern of their relationships but if i can just you show me your anger and i keep showing up because i'm consistent that can reestablish that trust. So I will often just say, you know what, I'm really sorry that, that I had to do that report. Mm -hmm. Here's why. I really want to help you through it. Yep. Um, and and I want to continue to provide services for you. Um, and, and by and often by doing that, and I just keep showing up, it will we'll we'll ride that storm together. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, we've had a couple questions along these lines. Any suggestions on using uh, the approach you mentioned today with clients that have memory loss or dementia? So this is this is where the emotion the emotion is more important than the words, um, and helping them to just helping them to address how they're feeling and what's going to make sense to help them feel better because if there's cognitive impairment addressing a cognitive problem doesn't work yeah right so so let me attend to how you feel what's going to make you feel safe what's going to make you feel comforted and that is what i focus on not where not who is in your home because mm -hmm. that's that's what they're going to bring up but what uh, what the real problem is is you don't feel safe so if I focus on no one's in your home, you know, it's just, that's just your caregiver. That's not, it's, I, I, I hear that you don't feel safe. So, so the more impaired they are cognitively, the more emotional I go. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The more I focus on what, what can you do to help you feel safe right now? Um, and I, I honestly do a lot of just grounding techniques. I want you to, to you know, just just take a deep breath, and and breathing techniques. I don't and and just breathing over and over again for a couple of minutes and let them know you are safe. They are not there to hurt you. And I repeat that a couple of times while they're breathing. 
That's great. I think we could all use some of that in the midst of this <laughs> pandemic yes, time. So, exactly. <laughs> um, and so another challenging question, which you may not have an answer to, um, that is somewhat related to uh, what I just said. Um, as a social services professional who engages clients over the telephone and may mm -hmm. have only interaction that way, um, how may the LEAP model be effective for us? And um, I brought this one up because a lot of APS workers are only doing, um, you know, uh, only interacting with clients via phone right now. They're not doing home visits at all because of the pandemic. Um, so is there any tips basically that you have for um, working with clients over the telephone? I found that I have to increase my, my, uh, <laughs> I don't even know what the word is. My uh huh, okay. The, those kind of those kind of things. There we go. Yes, I've had to increase those because I I do a lot of head nodding and and my my body language doesn't show, so I have to do it audibly, and I will and I also will say a lot i also will give them a heads up of what what's to come there's a there's a sentence that or there's a phrase in a lot of trauma work that says predictability facilitates safety so if i can tell them what to expect from my questions they're going to feel more safe so if I can over the phone say, all right, so I'm going to listen to you for a little bit. If you want, and I may, I may stop you at some point to ask for some clarif to ask some clarifying questions. Sure. Please don't feel that I'm, I'm not trying to cut you off. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding you and that I'm getting the full picture of what you are saying. So kind of a disclaimer. By, exactly. So the disclaimer and letting them know ahead of time really makes it a lot easier for me then to cut in and say, okay, so hold on a second. I wanna really make sure that, that I understood that last piece and by and i do that over the phone more frequently than i would in person because that shows more active listening yeah and the listening piece is really key it makes a lot of sense thank you um mm -hmm. here's one related to a point that you made earlier as i age and facial muscles change i have been told that i look quote unquote angry by people i work with when I may just yeah. be concentrating and in thought, not angry at all. How can I address yeah. this misconception? So I I do the half smile. Um, it is it, now which has its own downside because so the half smile is is there's actually a picture. It, it, it's a double benefit because it, it triggers your brain to feel happier. Um, you can go online and, and Google it. It's it's a like tiny, it's a tiny little smile. And I paste it onto my face and I practice it every day and it triggers your brain to think you're happy too. So um, it's a double benefit. Now the downside to the half smile is when I go into situations where smiling is not appropriate and i've conditioned my face to be smiling all the time people are i have to remember to take the half smile off um but i've that it, it honestly was just practice yeah. and then i also found that i had to relax my eyebrows because I would I would curse my eyebrows together when I was thinking about something, and so I had to relax my eyebrows. So this is why on this is why figuring out for you whatever shows up on your face. For me, it was those two areas specifically. Great. Um, 
here's another question, which may have a relatively simple answer is, and I hope I don't butcher this word, is anosognosia seen in consumers with traumatic brain injury? You know what, I, I don't know that for 100% certainty, but I would, I, I, would, I would venture to say yes, depending upon where the brain, where in the brain, what aspect of the brain was injured. Right. Um, so it's, I don't know, it, maybe not that they have a brain injury, but there may be aspects. I've had clients who have had schizophrenia that we think occurred after a brain injury, and then they've had anosognosia because of that. Oh. Um, so who knows what came first or how it all happened, but it's all there. Yeah. So I'm, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. I know traumatic brain injury can be really different depending on the injury and the person and all that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Here's another really good question that I know that everybody who's an APS worker has probably dealt with before. What can be done or what would you suggest to get a mental evaluation for a client who has dementia and is non-cooperative? Oh, gosh. So, well, when you say mental evaluation, it looks like they're talking about dementia, not necessarily mental illness, but I would say either, um, you know, any advice you could give for either of those situations. Well, there's layers to it because it depends upon mm -hmm. their le the legal status, you know, are they conserved or not? Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to, this is where going back to relationship building, I have done assessments with individuals who uh who who again don't believe that they have mental illnesses and but i talk to them about their anxiety the stress that they feel because everyone in their life is telling them that they have a mental illness Right. And so we have a conversation, but I have to legally, I have to tell them this is my job. My job is to do an evaluation and I'm going to give you, you know, my interpretation of what's going on. And so it gets a little bit tricky. And, but I find that by being honest and by saying, you know, this is what I see. And I understand that you and I, this is that agreeing to disagree, you and I may have different perspectives of, of what's going on. And that's okay. We don't have to have the same perspective. But if you've got someone who's under conservatorship, which again, it gets, it, and that's that's the hard part because often you need that evaluation to get the conservatorship. Right, right, yeah, which is guardianship in a lot of states. So a lot of our attendees would refer to that as guardianship. But yeah, no, you're right because oh, okay. sometimes the first step um, in yeah. establishing that is yeah. Is the yeah, and then I I go by then what I do is I do two things is I go by um, observation mm -hmm. and. Even if I can't, so I often can't get consent to talk to anyone, but my favorite phrase is we're always told I can either confirm or deny that anyone's receiving services, yep, yep. which is kind of a, but the second part is my favorite part. However, I can, I'd be more than happy to listen to any concerns that you might have today. And that opens the door for family members, loved ones to share whatever they want. Yep. And most states have le have legislation requiring um, social services providers to consider 
reliable witness testimony, especially when it comes to risk. I know California does, which is where I'm at. Yeah. Um, we have AB 1424. And so that requires us to consider the reliable witness testimony and, and family member testimony. So by saying that, often I can gather information from family members, which allows me to start painting that picture when, which when combined with my own observations, I may not need a whole lot from the client themselves because I've got all these family members providing me with information along with this other information of what I'm seeing. Mm. Yep. Makes a lot of sense. Well, and with that, uh, we are at 4.30. Um, Heather, if you wouldn't mind going to the last slide for me, it's got the mm -hmm. uh, email address and the um, web address for the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Reach out to us at any time. Again, you can download these slides if you're quick in the next few minutes um, in the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel, or you can reach out to us and we'll send them to you. And this presentation will be posted in approximately three to four weeks online um, on the ACL YouTube channel, and we'll make sure that everybody who's registered for today is notified about that when that happens. Thank you so much, Heather, for joining us and giving us all of these great tips for dealing with challenging clients because APS certainly sees its fair share of challenging clients. So we really appreciate all the information you've given to us today. Um, to everybody who's with us, please uh, complete your evaluation, which will pop up on your screen as soon as we are done. And then we'll also come in an email tomorrow to you as a follow-up to the webinar. Thanks so much for attending. Again, thanks, Heather so much for this information. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you all. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Take care. Bye.